Hey Citizen Tube, Steve here. Uh, I'm at the Berkeley School of Journalism right now to see Kevin Seitz speak. Kevin Seitz of the Hot Zone over on Yahoo. He basically pioneered sort of solo journalism around the world and did this great series on Yahoo last year where he went to every conflict ridden area on the globe and reported on what he saw, all using basically his video camera and his MacBook. So we're going to go hear his talk on solo journalism and maybe we'll get a chance to talk with him afterwards. Let's go. So I'm here with Kevin Seitz of the Hot Zone, who just spent a year covering conflict zones around the world. Kevin, uh, tell us a bit, why did you choose to cover uh, conflict zones as opposed to something else? Well, I felt that war wasn't being covered in, in the way I'd like to see it being covered, which is telling the smaller stories kind of in front of and behind those conflicts, because that's the human narrative that engages us. You know, when we hear about war and we hear about the larger issues there, I think you know, so much of it just makes us glaze over, unfortunately, because it's hard as a human to connect to an issue of resources or so on, but it's very easy to connect to a person that has lost or suffered or is involved in that conflict in, in some way. And that's the story that I wanted to report. I wanted to report those smaller stories that readers are going to look at and say, that's interesting, I want to know more about that person, and then potentially I want to know more about the larger issues and, and um, the larger conflict itself. You were in Iran, you were in Israel, you were in Palestine. At what point did you feel like you were in the most danger personally yourself? I, I don't want to... Or was there a place? Overplay. I mean, there's dangers in, in all the places that you go to some extent. I mean, Iran and Syria, not at all, because they're political conflicts at this point. They weren't armed conflicts. And honestly, you know, Somalia I had eight bodyguards. So there was a little bit of danger there just because it's so chaotic. It's been 16 years without a central government at this point. And, and so trying to be a journalist with eight people with machine guns surrounding you is difficult. It would be like the president trying to interview someone with all his you know, Secret Service people, you can't make that connection, it's hard. But there was a real danger, um, just because there are enough people angry at Americans and Westerners in general in Somalia. In Iraq, um, there's always roadside bombs, that, you know, there's a little bit more combat going on there than some of the places that I went to. Um, there's, there was danger there. I, probably the place that I was most in danger was the hottest conflict I covered, which was the, uh, the 34 day war between Israel and Hezbollah mm -hmm. in August. Um, we were constantly, you know, under very high-grade weapons, you know, mostly weapons that were manufactured by the United States that Israel was using, and, and that could be quite intimidating in a lot of ways. You have a background in, for broad, big broadcast networks. NBC was where you were. You were a freelancer who worked a lot for NBC before you started up with this. Why did you choose to do this online? Why was online video or solo journalism, as you call it, the way that this had to be done? Well, there was an evolution for me. You know, I had covered a controversial piece of video during uh, the Iraq War uh, in 2004 when a, a U.S. Marine shot an armed insurgent within that mosque. And I told the story on NBC, and I, I thought the story had a lot of shortcomings um, because of the amount of time that we had to tell it, but also because of some of the limitations of the medium. And I was able to use an independent blog to clarify that story uh, to a much greater degree. And I saw the power of the medium, you know, pointed out very clearly to me. And in some ways I feel like it's, it's my responsibility to pay it back to the medium. Uh, it is a, a terrific storytelling tool that allows us to report on different dimensions, three different dimensions, you know, providing still photography, video, text, you know, all of those things, plus interactivity. And you know, it's something that we need to nurture and, and we need to incubate and, and make better. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The business side of things is, is still up in the air. The business model for internet news isn't quite there yet. Uh, but Yahoo gave me an opportunity to do this, and I was very happy to take it. Well, you it strikes me that while you were gone, YouTube happened. For the year that you were gone, I, YouTube sort of did happen. Uh, it did happen. What, what's your What's your sense of YouTube? What do you think about it as a? I, I think it's been an amazing, democratizing source of of information. You know, I really like it. I, I want to see how it shakes out. It's it's disturbing, in, in some ways, all of the, the. Um, uh, intellectual property lawsuits and things that are going on right now, I'm sure that's going to take a while to shake out. But I like the fact that, you know, people from all over the world, anywhere in the world, uh, can make a video somewhere and upload it and people can see it in another place uh, without necessarily a filter. 
What do you think about average citizens using video to tell stories in new ways, whether it's gotcha moments or... I, I think it's very enabling and it's a great thing to see um, because there, there are very few private moments anymore. I mean, maybe, that, maybe that's the downside. I mean, there, there would be nice to have some private moments every once in a while. We're kind of living our life on television. But at the same time, those, those dark things that happen in our society are not so hidden anymore. Um, cases of police brutality or perhaps crimes or corruption can be more easily revealed you know, by citizen journalists and by mm -hmm. people with cameras and so on. There's also uh, the possibility of more confusion, that, that some of these things might not be real, uh, they're fabricated, or that maybe they're not the complete context, and we have to. That's interesting. Now, it destroys a piece of our humanity every time we have to go to war. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there's an aspect of that that we have to look at, too. We're asking young men and young women to take lives, and when they come back, they're going to be changed. There may be justification in it. There may be wars that are justified, and I'm not making a judgment about that, but what I am saying is that any time you ask someone to kill like that, you're taking some of their humanity as well. So their, their ability to live a civil life, to, to come back here and live as, as civilians, might be partially destroyed as well. Right, right. I lied, one last question. What would you say to the YouTube community? People out there who have video cameras want to go out and tell stories just like you do. Maybe not in the hot zone, but uh, around the U.S. Or like talk to them directly. Yeah, yeah, talk to them directly. Tell the stories. Get those cameras rolling. Never shut them off. You got a story to tell? Tell it.